Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Suzy Customer Summit Fireside Chat. We are here to talk shop today about product innovation. I'm Carly Skinder, Director of Enterprise Growth and Strategy at Suzy, where I partner with some of the world's biggest enterprise companies to transform the way market research is done in 2021. This particular panel is designed to give you a look at how one of the world's biggest confectionery companies in the world, Mars Wrigley, is transforming its R&D, sensory, and innovation programs today by introducing the voice of the consumer earlier in the development process. I am joined on the virtual stage by a real expert in this space, Lisa Saxon-Reed, who is a fearless R&D and sensory leader, and who, in my humble opinion, offers a really interesting perspective as a classically trained insights person turned R&D. I could keep bragging about Lisa for a while, but I will hand it over to her directly uh, for an intro. Lisa, tell us who you are, where you work, and what you do. Absolutely. Thank you, Carly, for the generous introduction. My name is Lisa Saxon-Reed. I head up the global sensory team at Mars Wrigley, and I'm also the interim head of design. And so I'm based out of our global headquarters, which is in Chicago, Illinois. So yes, we test candy for a living. My teenagers love it. Amazing. All right. So let's, uh, let's do this thing. Uh, I want to start high level and kick things off with a general understanding of what this year has looked like for you. Uh, with all the uncertainty with COVID and when we might open up again, how have you shifted your R&D and sensory programs? Yeah, so one of our key missions for the sensory team at Mars Wrigley is about fostering consumer centricity. So we really want to connect the teams with our consumers so we can help delight them. Again, we work at the candy company. Um, starting with COVID almost a year ago now to today, it's been really hard. How do we have that intimacy with the intimacy with the consumers when we can't be in their homes, when we can't be in the stores with them? And so like most other companies, we've had to do the pivot. And so the benefit, though, of the pivot, the enduring benefit, is we are much more comfortable with the virtual. We're much more comfortable talking with consumers, just like we're all talking here today. And actually, it's worked out okay. We actually can do things in their homes with them. We can see their cupboards. We can see what their experiences are like. So that's been one of our biggest challenges, is how do we keep this intimacy and stay safe? And I do think this is going to be something that this endurance of the virtual way of keeping that consumer connection alive. Yeah, and uh, it's encouraging to hear that in the world of sensory, especially where so much of the work you're traditionally doing is in person, that you yeah. have managed to shift to digital and shift to this virtual environment while still maintaining that level of consumer intimacy that is so important in your role. Um, what have been some of the biggest 2020 learnings reflecting on the year? And how do you think that those learnings will continue to shape the way you think about research and insights moving, moving forward? Yeah, so one of the enduring bits, as I've already started with a little bit, is virtual is not going away. For us, it's a new way of doing business, whether it's meetings like this that we'll be doing virtual as opposed to always being in person, whether it's having conversations with our consumers. I definitely see virtual um, will continue to go. And then at a macro trend level, there are some, like all of us, continue to look at what's going to be enduring and what is simply because of the COVID times. So not being confidential here, um, we are seeing, like many others, this concern about health and well-being um, that we're seeing in the COVID times is only going to continue. So what does that mean for us at the candy company? A lot of activity going on that. Also, this concern about um, security, physical security, what social distancing looks like um, in the new world order is obviously something that we're concerned about as being an impulse-driven company. So those are some of the things that um, are on our minds as we as a company continue to pivot to meet consumers where they're going to be once we get out of COVID. Absolutely. And as you're starting to think through some of these macro trends and figure out what that means for you and your portfolio, what does success look like for you this year as we look forward in 2021? Yeah, so for us, it continues to go back to understanding the consumer and meeting them where they're comfortable meeting with us. So I've said it once, I'll probably say it 10 more times before we're done today, is how do we keep that consumer intimacy alive with all these barriers in front of us today? So that's a key to our success. Again, understanding the consumer, understanding how he and she are feeling about our products today and how do they need to continue to evolve. So for us, success is keeping intimacy in the time of COVID and developing solutions that will delight them when we get out of COVID. 
I love it. That has been an awesome kind of overview of some of the macro challenges as well as lessons that you've had reflecting on the year. I'm sure all of those themes, regardless of if you're in the food and beverage world or not, are, yeah. are very applicable to so many uh, for everyone who's tuned in. Um, I'd love to shift gears and get mm -hmm. into the role of R&D and sensory within your organization. Yeah. So if Sensory's job is really to understand how your brands and products can create the right experiences for your consumers, where does Sensory or R&D's role typically start or, and stop? So in other words, can you walk us through how the traditional yeah. product renovation or innovation gets kicked off and develops at Mars? Absolutely. So Sensory is just a big word for insights in R&D. Um, the way we do it at Mars Wrigley is we have a very strong consumer part of sensory. And then we also have what some people think of as sensory, which is your characterization. So for us, part of the secret to our success is being able to do both, um, making sure we know what consumers love and then being able to characterize it so that we can reproduce it day in and day out at our factories. So with that as a little bit of a background, then how we fit in. So let's say consumers want something that's indulgent. They're like, Lisa, it's chocolate. Well, believe me, there's a wide range of things when someone says they want something that's more indulgent, that's escapist, maybe hedonistic even. Those are big words. Um, when it comes to a product developer, trying to figure out, well, what does that mean for what I need to do either to this product or to create a new product? So what Team Sensory does is try and understand, well, what does that actually mean from the consumer perspective? What is the reference points when they, what are the examples they use um, when the consumer is talking about that? And then we can go ahead and start to characterize those attributes to inspire our product developers on what it is to start to make. They're the food scientists, we're the consumer folks. And then when the relationship works really, really well from that very beginning for the consumer inspiration and us working in an iterative manner with our friends in product development, then we go through your typical validation curve to make sure that what marketing then talks to the consumers about indulgence, that that product actually delivers on that experience. So hopefully that wasn't too much detail for you, Carla. No, it, it all makes sense. And what you're talking about is just kind of maintaining that consumer intimacy for every single stage of the product development uh, cycle. Can you talk to us a little bit about why consumer feedback is so important to integrate early on in the development cycle? Absolutely. Um, there's, you know, depending upon uh, what company you're at, you might hear something. And I've actually heard this in my career. We don't have time to go to the consumer. We got to get it out there. I'm like, what? You don't have time to talk to the consumer? How might that be true? Yes, we have our own consumer intuitions and we should lean to that from a hypothesis generation, but we've got to get into the consumer's minds and hearts and understand what their dreams are. And the best way to do that in my experience is at the very beginning, understanding their frame of reference and what they're looking to do, what job, if you will, that they're hiring the product to do. If we know that upfront, then we can iterate quickly throughout. If we're like, yeah, you know, we want to have a Starburst jelly bean and we make a Starburst jelly bean and we put it out in the retail, that's good. But what would be great is, well, how do jelly beans fit into the Easter season? What is Starburst unique reason why that would make sense? And then what does that flavor look like? Um, that is a winning proposition. And trust me, it doesn't take more time. It actually can take less time. If we're really clear on the consumer ask, we can be laser focused throughout. Mm -hmm. And with so many agile tools out there, there is this possibility to on demand always connect with your consumer. So uh, to your point, there is no excuse for not leveraging the consumer voice anymore. Um, and on the flip side, so you're talking about a lot of the recipes for success, how you've been able mm -hmm. to work cross functionally in a really iterative manner by introducing the voice of the consumer. What are some of the pitfalls that you have either personally experienced or seen mm -hmm. other teams experience uh, when they are when they believe that some of these barriers around tapping into consumer feedback do exist? Yeah. So if I hear that, you know, um, we don't have time to talk to the consumer, we need to make a decision. So let's go with that. Right. So what has what's the pitfall of doing that? Oftentimes it'll be the person with the loudest voice in the room who makes that decision. And they might be Steve Jobs and that might be brilliant, but there aren't a lot of Steve Jobs out there. Yeah. And so that's what the risk is. We can make a decision quickly, but it could actually be not the profit maximizing decision for the consumer. And so because we have new tools that allow us to get quick feedback and constant iterative feedback from the consumer, why do we have to listen to the loudest voice in the room? Let's just go direct to the consumer and have him and her with us the whole way through. 
Absolutely. And uh, quite literally, that is the very premise uh, for why Suzy was born as an organization. It, it is very literally to eliminate those assumptions or those hunches that tend to happen at large organizations when there is this perception that you can't tap into the consumer for feedback. Um, so that was the perfect pivot to talking about uh, some of the reasons why Suzy has been a powerful tool for you and for the R&D team. Yeah. You shared two things, really. One is that speed is really magical for R&D to facilitate smooth project flow um, and keep those projects moving in the right direction. And two, this notion of going direct to consumer, especially within an R&D capacity, is a big mindset shift. So can you tell us about yeah. how these two things, direct to consumer and speed, um, are so important as it pertains to the role of R&D and sensory? Yeah, because I remember when I first learned about Susie, it was like, well, is that something we need in R&D? And the more I listened and learned, I'm like, oh, my gosh, we absolutely need it in R&D. Because there will be times um, as you know, as someone who's a food scientist or even in manufacturing, there are so many choices available. So what is the right choice to make? And again, we could have the debate and the loudest voice in the room, or we could actually go direct to the consumer and understand what he or she values. Um, and it's just a really small, simple example. How is it that you eat your Starburst? Do you put the whole thing in your mouth? Do you bite a little bit? When you put the whole thing in your mouth, do you chew it down? Do you suck it? You might be like, seriously, Lisa, this is an important question. It actually is. Because depending upon what is the, the common behavior in the states in this example, it dramatically impacts what that means from a formulation perspective and what it means from a, if there's any food people out there, you'll know what I'm talking about, what it means from a flavor and a texture perspective. So by being super clear on what the current behavior is and how in R&D do we want to support that behavior or do we want to switch it, it dramatically impacts what that means from a formulation and potentially a processing perspective. So to me, that's why these direct, um, very quick turnaround tools are super important to R&D because I don't want to do a big study that's going to take me six months that lays out the whole landscape because guess what? The consumer, especially in these rapidly changing times, their behavior may have shifted. The question I had six months ago may not be the question I have today to move the business forward. Why can't I have my cake and eat it too? Why can't I just ask the question, get the answer and get on with it? And that's to me why speed is so important to drive our business today. Absolutely. And uh, just as an aside, let's face it, you officially have the coolest job in the world that you get <laughs> Uh, Starburst and how consumers eat Starburst every single day. Uh, so I love that. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, at, you, what you were just mentioning is that at first there was kind of this question in your mind as to whether or not a platform like Suzy would be a viable tool for, for R&D. Um, at this point, obviously, Mars has been a longstanding partner of Suzy's for over two years. Yeah. So I'd love for you, uh, thank you for that, obviously. Um, and I'd love to hear from you why you initially saw the need for Suzy and what is keeping you and the team coming back year after year? Yeah. And so some of you who may know me, I am always on the hunt um, for what are ways we could do our job better or faster, right? Or cheaper, but definitely better or faster. And so when I first heard about Susie, I'm like, I don't know, could that work for R&D? Not sure. So for me, that's why I'm like, well, let's do a pilot. Um, and so I worked with the Susie team and we did, I think it was about a three month pilot, um, not only for me to experiment, but to democratize it with my team of sensory folks and just to see, well, what did they think? And I share with them why I was excited and what I thought we could do and then gave them the freedom to experiment with it. So then when it came time to say, well, do we want to renew it or not? Because I kind of see value, but what about the rest of them? I got the feedback from my team saying, oh my gosh, what do you mean? Of course we have to renew it. And that was really powerful. And why they said, well, of course we have to renew it because they saw the power in meetings as questions came up, they could go and get the information so that we can move forward in a consumer centric way. Mm -hmm. And so they love that. And then the other thing that they loved is when we do research from a governance perspective, especially these larger studies, they'll scope it out. They need to work it with me. We do the budgets, et cetera. For this, we did it as a, subscri a subscription model. So the team was empowered, go forth. Only if we're running out of questions, doesn't need to come to me. So it allowed them to experiment. You know, maybe they didn't ask it the right way and then they learned what went wrong and then they can ask it again. And it really empowered them to take more risks to really try and meet their uh, internal clients' needs. And yeah. so they also love that part too. So sorry, Carly, a lot of information there about why my team loves Susie. 
Well, it is good stuff to hear. That's for sure. And, you know, I know a big, uh, a bur- big personal philosophy or f- fee of yours is staying curious. That's right. Um, and so it's great to hear that you are embracing that with Susie um, and really kind of empowering your team to use the platform, test, learn, experiment, make mistakes, and then continue to get smarter together. Um, what was that early process for you? We just got off a, a previous Zoom call with uh, one of the other partners that we have, Nick Graham, who, for those of you who are on the line, was just talking a lot about how sometimes the hardest part is the initial adoption of the platform. Mm-hmm. So how do you, Lisa, empower your team to adopt a new tool at Scuzi. Yeah, so it first starts with um, protecting the budget. And so I always have a little bit in the budget um, in order to do some experimentation. And I protect it like you would not believe because I want to be open to Mm -hmm. not only staying curious, but being curious. Mm -hmm. And then um, with my team, they know why I'm excited about it. And so by leading by example and saying, here's why I'm excited about it. Here's what I myself am going in to learn more about. And then in our one-on-ones, just very classic management type of behavior or leadership more specifically. Hey, what are you working on? Hey, is Susie something to help with that as well? And then of course, having mentors within the group, I always have early adopters on my team, like every team has and really encouraging them to tell the story. So an example of telling that story is we have a monthly all team meeting. And so we do a nine minute, very quick in the R&D speak snippet of a project that someone's been working on and if Susie's featured, then we allow folks also, if they want more information, they can do a whole hour deep dive. Mm-hmm. So by normalizing these experiments, sharing them on a monthly basis, be it Susie or others, mm-hmm. that's how we really got up the adoption curve in Team Sensory. That's awesome. Just creating those environments where folks feel comfortable to share those learnings and co- to continue to learn from one another. Awesome. So this conceptual stuff is always very interesting. And I'd love to kind of bring it home for the folks in the line with some real examples of when you've turned to Susie and why. So Lisa, can you walk us through maybe one or two of the examples that we see here on the page, high level, and talk to us about when you turned to Susie and why it was so impactful? Yeah, so just a couple, and I'll just pick um, one of them about leveling up, um, leveling up our our understanding. So when you have a favorite, um, like a Twix, right, a Twix, um, how do you eat your Twix? You might be like, well, obviously, you just chomp. Well, actually, is that obvious? Um, Some people, believe it or not, do it in different ways for different reasons. So sometimes we just do it to get a truly consumer-centric view of how people are consuming our products, or like that Starburst example I gave. Um, sometimes, though, especially in the time of COVID, where we want to be really clear on how behavior shifts have happened or not happened, because we still do, it's, Susie's one of our tools, we still do some larger scale quantitative tests. So this one particular initiative was around our share size. And so before we did the quantitative testing, we wanted to understand have behavior shifted? Did we need to do our recruit? for that bigger study in a different way based on what's happening in the COVID times versus the pre-COVID times. So we've even used it as research uh, to help us get ready for, for other research. And then of course, we've also looked at it when I'm looking at you know new um, opportunities or new spaces, mm-hmm. um, just to understand what that competitive landscape looks like, what are products people are talking about, so that we can be from a landscape perspective, really understanding the consumer language, and then we could figure out, do we have a right to play in that space? So that's, without being confidential, that's at least a little bit of a feel for how, how we've used it. Oh, I'm sorry, Charlie, I forgot my favorite one, which was number one. Of course. Which is about in Stop the this World. Study. Yes. I love Stop the Swirl. And this goes back to in those team meetings that the loudest voice might carry or two loud voices are disagreeing. And then the team can't move forward. And so I call into my team stopping the swirl. It's like rather than having that debate and uncertainty, it's a very quick question. We can get a very quick answer and we can be data based in order to move forward. And so I love how it has stopped the swirl on a lot of our project teams. And um, now, like, it's really trained that behavior that as soon as it goes a little bit too long in a conversation, they kind of look at each other and they know we need to go ask Susie. Yep. Awesome. Uh, You mentioned one word that I or phrase that I love, which is small scale consumer experiments. Can you talk to us about what that actually means for you and how tools like Susie have allowed or empowered your R&D team uh, to be more agile and to be more consumer centric. 
Yeah, so as an example on that, um, all of us who are classically trained inside folks know about large scale competitive benchmarking. And there's always a role for that. So please mm -hmm. don't sit, you know, don't want to tell people don't do that. But sometimes that is an awfully big hammer um, to nail that in. So where the small scale experimentation is, again, trying to understand what is it that consumers are doing today? You can do a quick uh, couple of questions on Susie to understand for these consumers, what are they currently doing? What are their current products? And then you're like, ooh, they gave me that answer. That that wasn't quite right. Let me ask it in a different way because that, that's not relevant to me. And then you're like, oh, that was the better question to ask. And so that's an example of the experiments. It's very low risk. Like just get it out there, get some information and they can iterate and learn. And then it's all of a sudden like, oh, you know, we actually do need to do um, a larger scale study on that. But you have confidence that it's going to be actionable because we've done these small scale experiments and it failed and got back up and learned again. So that's mm -hmm. an example of how we used it in benchmarking, let alone obviously with new product initiatives. Awesome. And so tell us a little bit about the impact that Suzy and other agile tools have had for you. Obviously, as you mentioned, some of the traditional types of research are still going to play a really important uh, role in your research toolkit. Uh, but I'd love to hear about how Suzy has really fundamentally shifted and changed the way that your R&D workflows get done at, at yeah. first. Well, I can tell you for sure, no one's going to tell me they don't have time to talk to the consumer. So right. that part <laughs> has that. definitely been a big, a, a big impact. There is no excuse um, mm -hmm. not to talk to the consumer. Um, the other impact is more confidence in some of those iterative changes that we're making along the way or even at the very beginning. So we have more confidence on um, the changes, which is always a very powerful. And then I did talk a little bit about this, the impact on my team's engagement, um, that they feel very empowered and they can proactively go out there and experiment to learn more about the consumer without having to do a big old study and get all of these approvals. And I honestly think that makes our team um, a more agile team. I think it makes us a more curious team. And I'm really proud of that impact on our associates um, in addition to the business impact I mentioned. Amazing. Uh, so Rachel actually had a similar last question to oh, okay. I wanted to ask you myself, which is that um, has there been any any specific finding or, um, you know, aha moment that you've had in Suzy, um, any sort of data point or insight that was really interesting and uh, perhaps not expected? It's not expected. Um, one of the things that continues to surprise me um, on I just it's like when we do our fundamentals, like how do you eat your Twix? Um, you know, how do you eat your Starburst? I got to tell you, every single time we do one of those, I am always surprised because I'm like, really? You have 10% of the people who are taking off a little bite of the Starburst? Well, they make that experience last a long time. I wonder if there are things we can do to support that. Mm -hmm. So I have to say the biggest surprises for me on Susie are the most fundamental questions because every time I'll come back with, huh, and then the, then the follow up on that is, do we want to support that behavior? Is there another product that could better support that behavior? Or is it good that our product can be utilized in multiple ways? So there's some line extensions that would come out um, just because of that fundamental learning. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the more consumers you talk to, the more findings and, you know, perhaps serendipitous understandings you'll have. Um, oh. Yeah, if I can play on that. And that's one of the things that has been so fun because there always seems to be 10 to 15 percent of um, when we do these foundational, how do you eat your Twix? There's like 10 to 15 percent who are always doing it in a way I would have never dreamed about. So then, of course, my question is like, huh, am I consistently saying that I am? Huh. I wonder what that might mean. And is that an opportunity or is that just random? So if I wouldn't have been doing, meaning our team wouldn't have been doing all of these different studies, I may have missed that it's not just this random one thing. There's yeah. something broader going on about um, how at least Americans are consuming their candy. I love it. Connecting the dots between all of our consumers on Susie. Awesome. Exactly. So I know we have five minutes left. I want to make sure we ask, we answer some of these audience questions. Yeah. Um, one from Joe is, has there been anything that was on track to go to market, uh, but had uh, questionable or unremarkable testing results that you actually changed course as a result? Yeah, so one of those um, was actually some of you, if you're a big M&M fan, um, you may have seen something we launched called Hazelnut M&Ms. And um, 
we were trying to figure out a few different things. So actually we went on to Susie and what we found out was the frame of reference on the hazelnut m and was a little bit different than what we were doing from a product development perspective. And mm -hmm. so that data, in addition to some other data we had, really caused us to double down on what was the frame of reference for the consumer from a hazelnut perspective in the context of m and I'm trying not to be confidential, but to give you enough on that, that did help us um, change the direction and did lead to the reform. Awesome. Yeah, let's let's uh, not have your legal team come after you in the last five minutes. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing. So we can end on a uh, soft note, which is kind of bringing us full circle with the initial introduction. Um, we have Abel kind of inquiring about what your your personal career trajectory looked like. Um, yeah. Obviously, you used to be within the insights world. You've now shifted to more of the R and D focus. Um, mm -hmm. Can you walk us through kind of what that transition has looked like and what inspired you to make that move? Yeah, so I am a, a classically trained insight professional. I'm starting out of undergrad, a political science and diplomacy affairs undergrad um, at in Procter & Gamble. And they taught me insight um, in the CMK context is what they call it today. I then went to Unilever also in that they called it CMI and was actually a regional director for deodorants when we launched Dove Deodorant in the States, Axe, et cetera. And I absolutely loved it, um, but I wanted to continue to grow and develop. So I took a broadening move into what they call consumer and technical insight. We call it sensory at Mars Wrigley, a.k.a. insight and in R&D. Yep. And I loved it. And 10 years later, I'm still on the insight and R&D side. And I think part of it is my passion for the consumer. Oh, and I got an MBA along the way, too, because why not? Uh, but my passion for the consumer, my business training with the MBA, I think my diplomacy and foreign affairs, looking at things from different perspectives, all have made me the hashtag stay curious mm -hmm. um, insight professional that I am today. So many of us at Insight have an interesting, twisty, turny career path. Yeah. Um, but I have absolutely loved working with the scientists in R&D and just helping them see that the voice consumer is not scary, it's not hard, and that it can really help us hit out of the ballpark from day one. So that's my career path and why I've stayed on the R&D side. Amazing. Well, as always, Lisa, it's amazing to talk to you. You and I could uh, could riff for hours <laughs> in the spirit of staying curious, but I think that covers us with all of the questions, and we have about two minutes left, so I will give everyone a water break or a rest <laughs> break before uh, our networking session if you guys are registered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Lisa, it is always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time uh, and great conversation. Thank you so much, Carly, for the opportunity. And remember, everybody, hashtag stay curious. There we Have go. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa.